Scam Alert, learn how to protect yourself from fraud attempts. Then discovering the value of your real estate can provide financial security. And deferring your CPP can increase your income, but can you afford to wait? All this and more today on The Wealthy Life. if only there was a flashing warning every time someone tried to scam you. With us today is Detective Sergeant Andre Almeida from the Victoria Police Department to share tips on how to protect yourself. Welcome to the show, Detective. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> or Sergeant Detective, I guess I should say. That works too. So people are getting scammed. It feels like left, right and center these days. We've all had certain experiences. What are the most common types of scams you're seeing? Well, we're seeing them all over the place. A lot of voice scams, email scams, romance scams. There's business um, email compromises. Um, they're they're basically everywhere. Romance scams? What's that about? <laughs> well, it's it, it's it's a scam when somebody will trick you into believing that you have a relationship with somebody. Usually, they they'll they'll start off meeting you on a dating app, and then they'll they'll trick you into and into basically having a relationship with and eventually there'll be some point where they ask for some money. And once that happens, they usually direct you to attend to your bank, take out money and then attend to one of these Bitcoin ATMs and deposit money in that or make money transfers overseas. How do you know if it's true love or a scam? Well, I think any time that somebody is directing you to a Bitcoin ATM, and these are ATM locations across Canada, um, these locations aren't regulated by any police or government agency. And so when the money gets deposited in there, it's gone. And so there's a way to trace it, but it takes a lot of work and it's labor intensive. So once that happens, I think that should be the, your immediate warning sign that somebody wants you to go to a Bitcoin um, ATM. That's a warning sign of that maybe I need to check on this relationship. And even transferring money to bank accounts, especially overseas, Yes. You know, if you're dating someone and soon into the relationship, they need a whole bunch of money, that's probably a big red flag. It is. It is. It's something that you should really look at. Yeah, no, people, I think, maybe feel embarrassed to ask a friend or tell the story to a family member after it's happened. But if they can get over that embarrassment, should they report this and who to? Yes, this should definitely be reported to your local police department, as well as there's the Canadian Anti-Fraud Centre, who is always, uh, they have a 24-hour line as well as an email address and um, web page. Now, you talked earlier about investment scams. How does that work? Well, yeah, I mean, investment scams are usually when people are offering, um, uh, it's a larger type of, of investment. So it's usually a profit of an 8 to 20% return on your on your. I want 20%. <laughs> we do. We all want 20%. And unfortunately, sometimes you have to go by the old phrase, if it's too good to be true, it is. Yeah. So, um, but usually these people will offer it. You'll meet that person and, and there'll be an exchange where you're signing documents. But there's always some missing link. And that's usually, your, there's no land titles or there's, there's something missing. And that's why you have to have that second opinion, um, a lawyer involved. You need to have that check and balance just to ensure that this is a proper investment. And these are usually through private investments, individual companies. This isn't going through, you know, a proper wealth management firm, meeting with an advisor in their office necessarily. It, exactly. Yes. A lot of times that's exactly what's happening with it. Yeah, because when you go to a reputable company and you've got all the proper documentation, everything's good. Yes. You can put your mind at ease. But, you know, that 20% return, but come to my little office back here in my garage and just sign here. Yeah. And, and that's exactly what, and it ends up leading to a fraud. Now let's talk about email, because that's email and phone, but email is probably more common than the phone calls that people sometimes get. Yeah, like for emails, it happens all the time where you're looking in your, your if you check on your junk folders, you'll see emails from people um, that aren't connected to you. They're offering stuff, but the emails will look very original. They'll look like they're coming from senders, and what they're trying to do is they're phishing to try to get into your computer, to get into your life. And so you need to double check before you respond to any email. Um, ensure that it's coming from a sender that you know. And even sometimes if there's any doubt, give them a call. 
and d that's a good idea, but don't use the phone number that's in the email. No, exactly. Because they're smarter than that, right? They are. Look up the phone number of the company or the person that is apparently sending you this email to see if it's legit. Yeah, and what we end up having is we call it uh, business email compromises. So what happens is somebody will, you, somebody from your business will click that link and they'll now have access to your computer. But what they'll have access to is all your emails and then they'll start figuring out and they'll start pretending that they're the business CEO or they'll figure out who the payroll clerk is and then they'll make a rush um, pay, request for a payment to a certain company. And what happens is now you forward that money and it'll look all original. So that's why you have to make sure that that email, always make sure you're picking up the phone, calling person live and that will ensure that you're the safety of your company. And don't click on any of the attachments or any of the links no, in the email. No, never open any of those attachments. Now, something I personally find helpful is, because we get a lot of these attempts, even on my own personal email account, I just look at the email address of who it's from. It usually gives it away right there. It looks like a funny email, and it's, it's not legit, so I can delete it. Now, I don't think the local police departments want to hear about all those, do they? No, they don't want to hear about all those. <laughs> We'd be inundated with calls and we already are. Yes. <laughs> but but it would be nice for the ones that actually do affect, that do take effect and there is money lost, then we want to hear about that. But the, the Anti-Fraud Center wants to hear about them all. Any final tips for our viewers today? No, I think, I, I think we go back to the old adage and we said it earlier. It's like, if it's too good to be true on any type of investment or any type of email that you're receiving, then it, it, it's too good to be true. Just look away from it. Have awareness, it's key. Yes, that is the key. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you very much for having me on. Don't go away. Up next, learn why a real estate appraisal is important. A real estate transaction is one of the most important financial decisions you can make. How can an appraisal help? Joining us now is Claudio Polito from the Appraisal Institute of Canada to answer that very question. Claudio, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. So Claudio, why would people need to get an appraisal done in the first place? There's many reasons for most for most Canadians, their first contact would be with a mortgage appraisal when purchasing a home. Uh, but we appraisers do more than just mortgage financing assignments. It could be for estate planning. It could be for sometimes matrimonial disputes or partner dissolutions, uh, investment analysis, consulting and advisory. There, there are many reasons why uh, you would want an impartial third-party opinion. Now, when someone goes to buy a house or maybe is selling their house, they'll often go a real, to a real estate agent. And why isn't that valuation good enough? Without talking too much on the, on the realtor's behalf, uh, appraisers are an independent third-party uh, component of any transaction. We have no vested interest in the transaction being completed. We have no vested interest in the value of the property. Uh, we're impartial. We, uh, we analyze, comprehensively research all variables and provide that impartial, sober second thought as to what the asset, in this case, the property, uh, is a fair market value. Now, I could see why that would be important in a number of situations. If I'm going to borrow money from the bank, uh, they want to make sure that they're lending the right amount. So they're going to want that objective third-party opinion. Now, what are some of the things that go into formulating a valuation during the appraisal process? What do you look at? Well, everything starts with the property itself or, or the asset itself. Uh, again, we, we, we focus mostly on real property, but as appraisers, we also evaluate machinery and equipment, personal property. But, but for the purpose of this, of this question, it starts with inspecting the real estate. So that would be inspecting the property, whether it be a residential home, an industrial property, a shopping mall, or what be it. So it starts with inspecting the so location, the physical attributes, how big is it, uh, when was it built, its condition, is there any deferred maintenance, any positive attributes about the property, recently renovated, uh, backing onto a ravine, a uh, beautiful backyard with an in-ground pool and, and cabana, things of that sort. And do you look at uh, market comparisons, like what have comparable properties sold for in, 
in recent days? So in, in the residential field, it's primarily on the direct comparison approach. So you try best find most similar properties within a, a tight geographic area having similar attributes, size, age, location, setting features to determine what a fair market value would be. There are two other methodologies that one could use. If a property is new or let's say it's a very unique special type property, then there's a cost approach, which is essentially, you know, you value, you come with a value for the improvements, which being the, the building and the value for the land combined the two to come up with a market value. Uh, for our investment properties, be it rental, commercial, plazas, offices, things of that sort, those are based mostly on the income producing uh, capabilities. So we would examine the revenue and expenses to, to provide a current value of what the projected revenue streams may be worth. Because that's what people are going to look at when they're buying it. It, it, it depends on the real estate. So on, again, on the residential side for single family homes, first time buyers, it's predominantly a direct comparison. What have your neighbors sold for? How do they compare it to the property you're inquiring about? Uh, for an investment, it's about the income. How much income can it generate? What are the expenses? Break it down to a net operating income and you know, give a present value of future earning potential. Now, what's the most unique item you've had to appraise? The most unique item? Uh, I, I actually appraised a, a parcel of land that was landlocked. Uh, no access. I believe, I, actually, I, I, I correct myself. The access was a three foot walkway was the only access you had to the property, uh, could not be developed, uh, environmentally protected, and arriving at what a reasonable buyer would pay for a parcel that you really had no access unless you're walking or taking a bike, even then it would be somewhat treacherous because of the, uh, the terrain and what have you. That was pretty, uh, that was interesting. Why is it important that people know the true value of their assets? When making an important decision, oftentimes the most important decision, you want to have all the, all the facts at hand. Uh, an appraisal will provide you that impartial third-party opinion so you can make that informed decision. Claudio, thank you so much for being with us today. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Stay tuned. Learn when to take your Canada Pension Plan coming up after the break. You're ready to retire, but when should you start taking your CPP? Certified financial planner Inez Arawi is with us to discuss what to consider when deciding whether to take your CPP early or late. Inez, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me today. So let's start off with addressing what is CPP? CPP stands for Canada Pension Plan. So it's a government pension uh, or government program, I should say, that allows Canadians who worked uh, in Canada to retire. So it's a partial uh, retirement income. Great. It's like a government-sponsored pension plan because not all employers have a pension plan for Canadians. That's right. So this will help people retire a little more successfully. Exactly. How do they contribute? So during their working years, uh, individuals contribute through their employers and also their personal contributions from their income. And someone who, for example, was self-employed would have to make the full contributions during their working years. And, and is it based on a percentage of the income you earn or is it a set dollar amount? That's right. It is a percentage uh, of the dollar you earn up to a maximum. And every year it is, that maximum is increased with inflation. And uh, it is during your working years between the age of 18 until the age of 65. So the longer you work, the more chances of higher, having a higher monthly benefit, CPP monthly benefit. So for those people that are self-employed, are they still able to contribute to the Canada Pension Plan? Yes. How does that work? So they would have to make the contribution through their tax declaration and they would contribute the exact same amount based on their, uh, it's a percentage of their uh, taxable income. But now they're paying for both their portion and the employer's portion because they wear both hats? That's right. So they pay more than what an employee would pay. But it's a great way to set up a future income stream for Absolutely. down the road. Yes. So what age can people start claiming their benefits, start pulling out an income from the Canada Pension Plan? 
The standard age is 65. Someone can take uh, their CPP benefits as early as age 60, and they can also defer them all the way till the age of 70. Now, why would someone want to wait? Why wouldn't they want to get their hands on their money as soon as they can? Deferring it till age 70 means you receive more money. So every month that someone defers uh, receiving their CPP benefits past the age of 65, so for every month they receive 0.7%, meaning 8.4% per year and up to 42% for the whole five years. And if they were to take their benefits at age 60 or prior to age 65, there is a reduction in the monthly amount of by 0.6% per month prior to age 65, up to 36% decrease at age 60. Okay, so if I take it at age 60, I'm going to get 36% less than at age 65. Yes. If I wait till age 70, I'm going to get 42% more than if I took it at age 65. Absolutely. Why would people want to take it early then? There are two reasons I would say why someone would want to take it early, even though there is a reduction right, in the amount if you take it before the age of 65. Uh, the two reasons would be if there is a shortened life expectancy or if they have a low retirement income. Okay, so talk a little bit about shortened life expectancy. How do we know how long we're going to live? <laughs> yes, I would say uh, first one is the health, uh, medical conditions of a person they would know, and also based on obviously uh, that aspect, and also uh, with the um, history of longevity with the family, right? So that can maybe give a sense of what the life expectancy would be for that person. In this case, it would be... Uh, I would say I would recommend to take it earlier, the reason being that they can profit, benefit more. From you get your hands on the money now. Earlier, right, right. And for a longer time. Right, and you know, <laughs> if you've been diagnosed with a critical illness and you know for a fact your life expectancy is shorter, then start taking it earlier because you get that income over all those extra years, even Absolutely. though it is a little bit less per month. Absolutely, yes. So. If someone takes, for example, if someone has a life expectancy of 74 or younger, they should be considering taking their CPP at age 60. Oh, I was going to ask you, what's the magic age, okay. you know, of life expectancy to decide? Yeah. So if I plan to live into my 80s or 90s and beyond, what would you suggest? Yes, okay. So the, there is break-even age. I, yes, so like I just said, someone with a life expectancy of 74 or younger should consider taking their CPP at age 60. Someone who has a life expectancy of 82 or older should consider delaying their CPP until the age of 70. And someone who would have a life expectancy between 74 and 82 should consider taking the CPP at 65. Oh, that's super helpful. Now, obviously, it's not one size fits all, and there's lots of things that people need to consider. What if someone is still working? Should they take their CPP? Great question. Uh, they could be taking their CPP while they're working. However, it is not recommended um, in terms especially of financial planning. So what happens is that when there's... Um, when they're still working, they're earning an income and paying taxes on it. CPP is also a taxable income, which means that it will increase their tax liability. Uh, so we would recommend to defer because not only are they um, increasing their monthly benefit, which every month that they defer it, they also usually don't need it if they're working. And uh, they are still in a way contributing to that, uh, to the CPP by working, right? So there are many advantages for them to just defer that amount. So there's a lot of variables that come into play in making the right decision of when to start your CPP. Where can people go to get the answer that's right for them? The answer is definitely through a financial plan or meet with a financial planner because there are many reasons why someone would consider taking it before or reasons and benefits for taking it and delaying it until the age of 70. Well, thanks for sharing everything you know about CPP with us today. Thank you very much, Sybil. And after the break, learn why the perfect time to invest might be always, thanks to dollar cost averaging. Welcome back. Thanks for your emails and social media messages. We love hearing from our viewers. Today's question is from Tegan. 
Dear Sybil, I recently inherited a nice sum of money and want to get it invested, but don't know when the right time is. A friend told me to consider dollar cost averaging. How does that work? With gratitude, Tegan. Well, Tegan, great to hear that you've got a nice lump sum of money to get invested, and even better to hear you want to invest it. You can't time the market. It's absolutely impossible. Many people try and many people fail. That's where dollar cost averaging comes into play. The premise of dollar cost averaging is putting smaller amounts of money into the market, getting it invested over a longer period of time. So if you took that lump sum that you have today, divide it by say 10, and invest a 10th of your money every month over the next 10 months, that would be dollar cost averaging. You could even space it over a longer time period. You could invest a chunk of money every three months and do that over a couple year period. Now with the money that you're not investing right away, don't let it sit there in cash, at least park it in a high rate savings account so you're earning something. Now I'm gonna give you a specific example on dollar cost averaging so you can see it in action. If you have $500 to invest and you wanna put it into, let's say, an exchange traded fund that costs $10 a share, you would be able to buy 50 units with that money. Let's say the markets pull back and now all of a sudden, instead of $10, it's $5 a share now all of a sudden you can buy twice as much. Buying twice as much better prepares you for when the markets recover. You've got more units exposed there to benefit from a recovery in the market. The reverse is also true. You don't wanna put all your money in the market and all of a sudden it pulls back and drops by 20%. You'll kick yourself. So breaking it into smaller pieces, investing it over time, is gonna get you a better average price and it's gonna keep you disciplined so you make sure that your money grows faster over a longer period of time. And that wraps up this edition of The Wealthy Life, helping you make smart financial decisions. Join The Wealthy Life Club and you'll get access to everything you need to live your version of The Wealthy Life.